On May 23, 1992, on a highway connecting the city of Palermo to its airport, a car bomb exploded, killing Giovanni Falcone, his wife, and three members of their police escort. His death came at the height of a power struggle between the Italian state and the Sicilian Mafia, a vast criminal syndicate who had supremacy over the island of Sicily. Falcone was a leading figure in the anti-mafia movement in Palermo. He refused to be bribed or intimidated by the Mafia, standing up to them instead. He was a judge, using his legal authority to prosecute mobsters and rewrite the criminal justice system to close legal loopholes that kept the Mafia ahead of law enforcement. He also encouraged Mafia members to disclose illicit activities in exchange for reduced jail time. In other words, he encouraged mobsters to rat each other out. He worked closely with another judge, Paolo Emanuele Borsellino, who was also assassinated in a similar manner by the Mafia a few months later. Their deaths shocked Palermo. After more than a century of living in fear, the city finally had enough. They flooded the streets, protesting the corruption of the Mafia and mourning the loss of friends and family. Newspapers published headlines comparing Palermo to war-torn Beirut and Lebanon, who had just faced its own civil war. How did Palermo become like this? What led to the Mafia becoming so powerful? How did it impact the architecture of the city? Is the Mafia still wreaking havoc in the city? Stick around to learn about Palermo's complicated past and future in the Mafia's shadow. My name is Angelo and this is Architecture with Angelo. The Mafia doesn't have a clear start point. It gradually evolved over the course of hundreds of years. I'm not even sure where the name Mafia comes from. A leading theory is that the name's origin comes from a Sicilian Arabic slang word that means acting as a protector against the arrogance of the powerful. Sicily has been run by occupiers throughout its history. Greeks, Romans, Germans, Frenchmen, Spaniards, Arabs, and Moors all laid claim to this island at some point in its complicated history. These rulers were a constant threat to Sicilians who formed groups of armed bandits to protect themselves and protect landlords from danger. There was no centralized authority governing the Mafia, but they began developing their own code of rules and morals. A parallel legal system began taking shape that was different from the legal system of the occupying government at the time. During the 19th century, the Mafia as we know it began taking shape. It was a confusing and chaotic time for Sicily. Italy underwent a gradual process of unification at this time. It used to be fragmented, being governed by various kingdoms and city-states. But a man named Giuseppe Garibaldi led military campaigns to bring the vast majority of Italian territory under the control of one government. In 1861, Sicily merged with the newly formed Kingdom of Italy. During the late 19th century, the new government in Rome struggled to establish itself as a legal authority for the country. Enforcing laws was difficult. As a result, Rome made a deal with different groups in the Mafia. The Mafia would enforce Rome's laws and maintain order, and in exchange, Rome would look the other way and the Mafia committed their crimes. At the same time, the Catholic Church, who owned farms in Sicily, saw the chaos of Sicily and recruited the Mafia to watch its properties and keep its tenant farmers in line. In the power vacuum of a unified Italy, the Mafia assumed the role of law enforcement. The Mafia blossomed into the organization we know of today. Soon, nearly every economic activity involved the Mafia in some way. Want to open a business? Give some of your income to the Mafia. Want to protect your farm? Give some of your money to the Mafia. Did someone steal from you? Go talk to the Mafia. They will handle it. The Mafia became a de facto form of governance that people had to go through to solve everyday problems. They fueled a vicious cycle of crime and poverty that kept Sicily underdeveloped. The Mafia seemed invincible, until one leader tried to stop them once and for all. Benito Mussolini, known as Il Duce to Italians, came to power in the midst of economic and social turmoil after World War I. He combined ultranationalism, corporatism, and hyper-conservatism, jailing and persecuting those who stood in his way. His dictatorship was ruthless and served at his every word. In his quest for power, he did not like other people making their own laws and enforcing them. To him, that was a sign of weakness. While the North was heavily in favor of fascism and Mussolini at the time, the South was more skeptical of him, especially in Sicily. They saw Mussolini as just another man in a long line of invaders. So he launched a vigorous anti-mafia campaign, appointing Cesare Mori as prefect of Palermo. Mori arrested 11,000 Sicilians and Mussolini declared the mafia as extinct. However, many of the mafia actually fled to the United States, escaping justice at the hands of Mussolini. When Italy was fighting in World War II against the Allies, the Americans adopted the mantra, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The military forged alliances with key figures of the American mafia to help both groups achieve a common goal, taking out Mussolini and his government. They worked with Bucky Luciano, Mayor Lansky, and Frank Costello to establish contacts in Sicily for their invasion. After the Allies won, they freed and imprisoned mafiosi and appointed them to administrative positions in the government, allowing them to effectively run the show in many towns and cities, including, of course, Palermo. Bolstered by the Allies and more powerful than ever before, 
the Mafia picked up right where they left off before Mussolini took power, and they changed Palermo forever. Until the end of World War II, the majority of Sicilians lived in the countryside. Many were devastated by the war, losing everything and being unable to profit off of farming. Some Sicilians emigrated to the New World, especially to the northeastern United States. Others, however, stayed in Sicily, moving to cities like Palermo. In a span of 10 years, 100,000 people moved to this city. The city was overwhelmed by the housing crisis. The problem was compounded by 40% of Palermo's housing stock being destroyed by World War II. Designing beautiful buildings detailed by craftsmen was seen as useless, and city officials instead sanctioned the construction of residential apartment blocks in Palermo's suburbs. Palermo was not unique in doing this. Cities throughout Europe did this. It was cheap, easy to replicate, and allowed for people to be housed quickly. But what makes Palermo unique is the lack of planning that went into this. In the span of 30 years, they nearly destroyed the cityscape. Here's how. Meet Vito Cengimino. He was born in 1924 and had a privileged childhood. He lived in Corleone, the home of the Corleonese Mafia. Growing up, he set firm roots in the Mafia way of life, using the connections he made to become wealthy as an adult. He struck it rich after securing an important railway contract and became the head of the Council for Public Works from 1959 to 1964. The mayor during this time was Salvo Lima, who worked hand in hand with Gianci Mino to strike it rich with the Mafia. He was a Christian Democrat, the political party that dominated Italian politics until the 1990s. This center-right party became infamous for accepting bribes and looking the other way when dealing with the Mafia. Or, in the case of Cianchimino, politicians would make overt deals with the Mafia, using public funds that were supposed to rebuild the war-torn city and promote economic development in Sicily to enrich themselves. Before Cianchimino took power, Palermo looked quite different. The city itself was well-designed and architecturally complex, with differing styles coexisting to give the city its distinct look. Palermo used to have a vast green belt filled with parks and mansions for the elite to live and commoners to just enjoy nature. This growing class of elite was a mixture of old and new money, the old money were from the Sicilian nobility, while the new money was best represented by the Fiorillo family, who made their fortune exporting Sicilian products like wine as well as in other industries like shipbuilding and mining. The layout of Palermo was all very intentional. The green belt functioned as the lungs for the city, enhancing air quality and keeping the city cool. Cool Mediterranean air would bounce off the mountains and keep the city temperate even during the hot summer months. These design requirements were still on the books when the Mafia built their apartment blocks. They just simply ignored them. Centuries of careful planning were wiped out in the span of a few decades. All the hard work of architects and urban planners was disregarded from the process, and money and greed were the only goals. Here's an example of how the Mafia operated. Two mafiosi owned land that the zoning regulations said would house an elementary school in Palermo. They got the right to move the school to other land. The Department of Public Works, however, had a final say in the matter. They rejected it. But the mafiosi built a nine-story apartment building anyway. It was completely illegal, but the mafia disregarded it. They don't care. Gianchimino signed 4,000 building licenses in five years. 2,000 of them were for three men who knew little about construction, but knew a lot about making a fortune building low-quality concrete boxes in the sky. Even the concrete was cheap. See, basic concrete is made up of water, sand, and cement. What the Mafia would do is use less sand and more cement and water, weakening the concrete and making it more prone to damage and even collapse. The locals, meanwhile, were completely helpless. Their city center, filled with architecture they admired, was left to crumble. Much of it was not rebuilt after being bombed during World War II. They felt more unsafe than ever before. Their green belt, an area of refuge, was filled in with concrete. Beautiful mansions were destroyed in the blink of an eye to make room for ugly tower blocks. Many of these mansions were built in the late 19th and early 20th century and were in what is called the Liberty style. See, this style is an offset of another style called Art Nouveau. You may recognize this style with its organic patterns and attention to detail. The Liberty style also drew inspiration from Baroque architecture, which is the style that was used for St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The Liberty style and Art Nouveau were reactions against the industrial era, which was focused on mass production and uniformity. Unskilled laborers would perform simple and repetitive tasks. The Liberty style and Art Nouveau encouraged individual craftsmen and skilled laborers to work on projects. An influential figure who introduced the Liberty style in Sicily was Ernesto Basile. His father, Giovanni Battista Filippo Basile, was famous for the Teatro Massimo in Palermo. While his father's buildings are considered neoclassical, being heavily influenced by the ruins of ancient Greece and Rome, Ernesto Basile was drawn to the more ornate Liberty style. He was one of the architects who designed the suburban mansions in Palermo's Greenbelt. One of his most famous works, Villa de Liela, was a masterpiece of the Liberty style, featuring elaborate organic details, elegant wrought iron, and extensive stained glass. 
Completed in 1905, this building was well liked by locals and studied by architects across Italy. After World War II, the master plan of Palermo sought to protect this land, designating the villa as public property. But this is just another example of this master plan being ignored by the mafia and the corrupt leadership of Palermo. The city got around preservation efforts by claiming that the building needed to exist for 50 years in order to qualify for protection. Only days before the 50th anniversary of the building's construction, the furniture was cleared and sold off and the building was demolished. Plans to develop on the villa's land never materialized and today there is just a parking lot where the Villa de Leela once stood. The brazen power exercised by the Mafia and the government represent the cronyism of post-war Palermo. The corrupt leadership in Palermo felt no shame in lining their pockets and helping the Mafia to line their own, all while systematically destroying so much of what made Palermo so special. That's why we call what happened to Palermo a sack. It was a plundering of architecture and land that was reserved for both the public and a growing entrepreneurial class to enjoy. From the 1950s until the 1980s, the Mafia made Palermo a dangerous and dirty place and a shell of its former self until the people, helped by the army and anti-mafia officials and politicians, finally stood up. The straw that broke the camel's back for Palermo was the second mafia war in the 1980s. In the rural town of Corleone, the Corleonese family grew absurdly wealthy for their involvement in the heroin trade. Sicily supplied a pretty decent chunk of heroin imported to the U.S. at the time, and the Corleonese was hellbent on expanding its reach across Sicily, infiltrating other mafia clans and killing off their leadership, acting almost like a parasite. Luciano Leggio and Salvatore Rina ruled with an iron fist, killing more than 1,000 mobsters, law enforcement, and civilians. The government was arresting lots of mobsters as a result, and decided to just hold a trial for everyone at once. This so-called maxi trial dealt with 475 indicted mafiosi at once. The trial took place between 1986 and 1992, with the majority being convicted. Anti-mafia officials involved in the case faced the music after the trial finished, including Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino. The city resembled a war zone, with the army being sent by Rome to maintain order. People protested the mafia and the decrepit condition of their city. They were tired of living in fear and closing their shops at 7 p.m. They just wanted peace. The government passed criminal justice reforms that made legal penalties harsher for people in or affiliated with the Mafia. Soon, rats began emerging and the Mafia was starting to crumble. Salvatore Rina was arrested, and with the arrest of more than 4,000 Mafiosi since the 1990s, Palermo and the rest of Sicily are cracking down on the Mafia heavy. Fast forward to the 2020s. Palermo has an uneasy future. With economic uncertainty and an uptick in mafia activity since COVID-19, the city is vulnerable. The Italian justice system is bogged down by inefficiency and is often very delayed when solving local disputes. Here, the mafia remain an influential force, acting as mediators and judges when local shopkeepers have disputes. For example, during the pandemic, the mafia distributed face masks and food parcels. They may not be the terror they once were, but ordinary Sicilians, especially business owners, still look to them to fill in the gaps made by Italian bureaucracy. Nevertheless, the Mafia is a shell of what it once was, and the city is much safer than it was during the 1980s and 1990s. Much of the historic center of Palermo, once clogged with cars, is now pedestrianized, making the city more walkable and appealing to tourists. Instead of closing shops at 7 p.m., people are out throughout the night. In many ways, it's a different world. People are repairing buildings in the historic center that were damaged during World War II. Palermo is also using an estimated 30 billion euros, or around 32.5 billion US dollars, to develop the city, repurposing around 800 properties that used to be owned by the Mafia. For example, the government built Girardino della Memoria, which commemorates those who lost their lives opposing the Mafia. Built on the estate of a mafiosi, it allows for Palermo to not forget the tragedy of the mafia. The government is investing so much money in creating spaces like this because they hope it will discourage a mafia resurgence, with people being aware of how dangerous the mafia truly is. It is a part of the slow and steady effort by the city of Palermo to rise from the ashes of mafia rule. Yes, the suburban tower blocks still remain, but how long will they exist for? Unlike the stone buildings that survived aerial bombings in the center of Palermo, these apartment blocks are flimsy and built to just maximize profit. The building's lifespan isn't important. So who knows how Palermo's suburbs will look 100 or 200 years from now. Hopefully when the blocks become too old to renovate, something new and architecturally respectful of Palermo is built. If Palermo wants to truly eliminate the mafia though, they need to work to make the whole city beautiful again, including the working class suburbs. They also need to speed up their legal system and gain the trust of the people. In the region, 30% of people and 40% of businesses trust their justice system, which are numbers that are way too low. If the government does not become more trustworthy, the mafia will always be present and waiting for an opportunity to strike back. 
unraveling all the progress the city made since the 1990s. Hopefully, that never happens.